John Kramer is dying. It's been six months since Jigsaw got the pieces knocked out of him by Detective Matthews, and he's not looking too great. Thankfully, he's got Amanda looking after him, and they're safe and secure in a brand new dilapidated factory. After blowing through an ungodly amount of money in the last film, Jigsaw's budget must be nearly diminished, right? By contrast, this is the largest location for a Saw film to date. An entire meatpacking factory ready to be picked apart for spare parts. So, can Jigsaw pull another big budget slaughter fest out of his hat? Or has he finally slaughtered his last piggy bank? Per usual, let's establish some ground rules. First, no bills, no utilities. The man can have his water, his power, plus abandoned places often still have the power left on. It's surprisingly cheaper than stripping the electrical access. Don't ask me, ask your local city council why the meatpacking plant can still charge your iPhone. Speaking of abandoned places, I'll permit Jigsaw the ability to scavenge for parts wherever he's located. I'll charge for materials and tools used in traps, but anything that can be foraged won't be expensed, and any parts that need to be machined won't include the cost of drill presses or lathes or what have you. We've expensed every workshop Jigsaw has had on camera, and not one has included a table saw, lathe, drill press, or belt sander. But who knows? Maybe that will finally change as we find out if Jigsaw can afford Saw 3. The movie opens where Saw 2 closed. Detective Matthews is occupado en el baño. As he's adjusting to his new efficiency living, he takes things in. There's Xavier, he's napping. There's what's left of Dr. Gordon, showing foot. And there's Matthews having an epiphany. He'll need to fix his foot problem to get out of the bathroom. Matthews reconsiders and pans the flashlight over to the mummy pretending to be Adam. Did he shave his head? Matthews ditches the saw in favor of ceramic and goes to town on his foot. There's nothing really to charge for here that wasn't covered in the last film, and Matthews is left to toilet bash his way into the title of the film. Some extensive metal cutting later, we're reintroduced to Riggs and Carey still on the hunt for Matthews. He's been missing for six months, and the trail has been cold. The trap belongs to Jigsaw, but the pieces of the deceased do not belong to Matthews. It's not Detective Matthews. The Greek god Detective Hoffman tells us that the victim strewn about was originally held in place by chains. The victim was held in place by these chains. In a flashback, we're introduced to Troy. Hello, Troy. Whose trap is everyone's worst nightmare to be in, getting sent back to school with no clothes on. Troy has been extensively chained to floor and ceiling, like he's auditioning for a Muppet Christmas Carol. Marley, Marley, and Marley? Eleven chains fix Troy to the room. A TV that once played Bill Nye now displays Billy. Troy is being punished for constantly going back to jail and is told to break the chains in order to escape. Troy notices the nail bomb with the timer and gets to work. Spoiler alert, the nail bomb wins. So we've got chains, bolted bits, a TV rolly cart, and a nail bomb. The chains could be sourced locally from the school, and even the bolted bits to affix those chains could be, again, locally sourced. Abandoned buildings can often have a trickle of power left going to them for cost reasons, so that's enough to power the TV, which could also have been found in the school. The VHS with Billy on it, though, will cost. What isn't locally sourced is a nail bomb. Or is it? Aside from the nails and the jar, the timer and the explosive bit can definitely be expensed. But how does one expense a nail bomb? The nail bomb is powered by four AA batteries. The device up front looks like a timer with some activation cord going into the bomb itself. Inside there will be the explodey bit that propels the nails into their home improvement destinations. I'd actually love to see someone try to hang art with a nail bomb. How fun would that be? Anyway, where would Jigsaw get an explosive for this little project? I don't know. Maybe he had some nearby in case an abandoned building was slated for demolition. God, if only Jigsaw had access to abandoned buildings that needed demolishing. C4 grade explosives are available to civilians in the business of demolishing buildings. That screwball jigsaw could very well have procured such explosives for our little Christmas popper. Same goes for the jar. All that's left to Bill here then is the batteries, the timer, and the fuse stuff. Troy does not escape his trap, and Hoffman pockets a souvenir from the scene. I'm sure it's for research. He seems like an upstanding guy. Riggs brings up a good point. How did Jigsaw manage all of this? The last time we saw him, he looked like Mayor McCheese with extra ketchup. Carrie doesn't think this trap was Jigsaw alone, or possibly Jigsaw at all. 
Also, the door was welded shut. Why did you have to cut the door down? Jigsaw gives people the chance to escape, but this trap was particularly brutal in its rebuttal of that core philosophy. Troy wasn't getting out. Begs the question as to whether Carrie was onto something, huh? Transitioning into Carrie's after work onsen, she's seeing ghosts. <gasps> and is hard at work dissecting the jigsaw tape recovered from the scene. But the channel has been changed. Instead of Billy, it's a live feed coming from inside the closet. Carrie shoots at the signal source, discovering a camera that teleports her to the most brutal trap in the series so far, the angel trap, or as I call it, the McRib. Hello, Carrie. The concept is thus. Carrie is strapped into a leather harness suspended by chains. She has 60 seconds to get that key out of that beaker filled with that acid before those wings unfold and take her ribs with them. So let's break down everything we've got. There's a TV, a very old TV, and we've got a VHS player and a VHS tape. The TV is old enough that I'll actually permit some thrifting here. I think it was foraged. The VHS player is unseen. It could be thrifted or scavenged at this point. Maybe Jigsaw loaded up on VCRs at the school. However, given that the sewers are not a school, I'm just gonna charge for it here. Uh, the VHS tape was already paid for with the previous combo pack. Next, we've got some acid in a beaker. The acid is very reactive to skin, somewhat reactive to keys. It eats flesh like a cowboy eats ribs. Based on my research, it might be hydrochloric, it might be sulfuric, but my friends in the field tell me it's probably hydrochloric acid at maybe 25 mole, and that costs around $125 a gallon. The mechanics of the trap itself appear to be tension operated, but there is a lot of hardware here, and a lot of it looks fairly new. We've got steel cable, stainless steel beams, iron, maybe aluminum. I think we can total these parts up to around $350. The leather harness also looks more professional than Mike's harness from Saw 2. It almost looks like a backpack strap system or maybe a, an apparatus for rock climbing or a parachute. I'm gonna say $75. It's fixed to the chains with master locks at the shoulders with two more locks on Carrie's hips. That's five master locks in total, including the primary lock on her chest. We know that a four pack of locks costs around $34. So let's say five for 40. So Carrie's smart. Let's see how she gets out of, oh, it didn't work. Oh no, there's no getting out. Oh, oh, she, oh, oh, she's dead. Ooh. Uh, Carrie dies, Amanda watching from the darkness. From the demise of Detective Carrie's life, we're taken to the demise of Dr. Lynn's ability to give a fuck. A hard day's night leaves Lynn knocked, waking up into, oh good, another secret lair. Oh, fuck me, there is so much going on here. Oh, it's like a science fair of pain. Ah. Okay, uh, six, maybe seven stainless steel tables are covered in a whole heckin' lot of stuff. Uh, there's another Hoyer lift suspending a mannequin in a stocking suit being suspended by chains. Oh, this is possibly a reference to Troy's trap. An early iteration of that trap during production was to have him suspended from the ceiling from all of his chains, but this idea was scrapped early on. It's neat to see Jigsaw's methodology at play as these movies developed though, and those little Easter eggs left in. We also get a recreation of the birdcage trap, only it's grown slightly. The likelihood of Jigsaw returning to the scene of the crime and absconding with a full proto trap is very unlikely. Anything we saw at that lair is lost as far as I'm concerned. That means this is a new birdcage trap. Thankfully, we know how much that costs. We can also see a prototyped McRib over there and we know the hardware cost for that, so let's add it up. Let's see if anything else stands out. Uh, there's a small militia of mannequins and mannequin parts. Again, he can keep those, I have no interest. Uh, this shot looks like it has a mannequin with an early version of Tony Stark's heart installed. Or maybe it's a bomb. Either way, it looks like we have some similar hardware like what we saw in Saw 2. Voltmeter, power supply, let's say this much. There's also a leg doing something out of a Christmas story in the foreground, but I'll have none of that. No. Uh, this shot isn't great, but you can see some chemistry happening. We can tally up those beakers, vials, heaters, and flasks to around this much. And unfortunately, we just don't get a better look than that throughout the film. But that's okay. We've at least charged for the projects that are furthest along. Lynn has been taken by Amanda, and she could use some peace and quiet. Oh, hey, that's the knife from Saw 2. That's neat. Amanda introduces Lynn to her new patient, 
Jigsaw. Holy hell, he's not looking good. Ooh. John's cancer is progressing, and the prognosis is bad. The good news is Lynn is gonna help. Amanda helps Lynn into her new uniform. The shotgun collar. So... This is an interesting piece of tech. There's five buckshot pointed at Lynn's face, and they're fixed to this shoulder pad piece that looks like a warped toilet seat. Mm, or maybe it's closer to a diving helmet? Like, I don't know. There are five hammers pulled back and primed to go off if Lynn gets too far away, or if John's vitals hit zero. And the whole thing is set with a key that lives around Amanda's neck. So, it's a pretty low stress situation. Your life and my life will end simultaneously. How to charge for this one? Well, the trap can be seen to operate in two parts. Part one is the shotgun element. Five shells of buckshot with hammers that look like they've been pulled from guns, the hardware to hold each one in place and to nail it down. The materials don't look new. Even the shoulder harness itself doesn't look new. God, maybe it came off a football uniform or like a fencing uniform. I don't, I, I don't know. I do not know. <laughs> Huh. The metal holding the slugs is, again, tarnished. They don't look like they were scavenged from guns. They look bespoke for this utility. The hammers are the only part I can identify with any certainty. Were they machined? Were they scavenged? Were they purchased? Well, purchased new, you can get replacement hammers for about $60 at the cheapest, upwards of $180 for nicer materials. In 2007, that price range would be closer to $40 to $118. I don't know about your local firearm recycling programs in the mid to late 2000s, but I'd hearken a guess that Jigsaw would just source the parts and buy them. Based on the design and my research, these look to be on the nicer than your average side of things. They could have been machined off screen, but since we don't see it happening and we don't see the hardware to machine them in the lab or in the studio, I'll charge $100 for each hammer, $500. The second part to this trap is the triggering element. And I don't mean the hammers. I mean the system on board that detects a disruption to John's vitals and also senses the invisible fence that would engage a kill state. So that's electronics, that's some light programming, that's some detection. When Amanda activates the collar, there's an indicator light on board, as well as the same electric fuse line that we saw used in the pipe bomb. So I looked into the tech that those old electric dog collars used for the area trigger, the invisible fence line things. And then I looked into the tech that senses when a connection has been lost. Blending those two together into the collar would cost around $250 in 2006. That puts the entire shotgun collar at around $750. Throughout the film, we're slowly introduced to Jeff and the kind of guy he is. <laughs> what kind of guy are you are? Uh, Jeff has a micro cassette recorder and tape waiting for him inside his forklift condo. Hello, Jeff. Waiting just outside the condo is a concussion. You see, Jeff has been turning into the Punisher ever since his kid died. Apparently he wasn't good at it though, because Jigsaw went and captured everybody responsible for the death of his little kiddo. Jeff has two hours to get through his carnival of depression, if that concussion doesn't floor him first. Also, I'm not charging for the forklift. This whole movie takes place in a very lived-in factory. It might as well be a long holiday weekend for all we know. Much like we saw at the elementary school, this movie reflects that Jigsaw is potentially running low on cash. And in his debtor's panic, he's occupied a very well-stocked meatpacking plant. Whatever isn't native to the plant we can charge for, but anything that belongs to the setting is gonna be free of charge. Jeff spots a camera and some instructions along with a key. I think we've seen this type of camera before in Saw 2, and we've definitely seen that key before. Gotta love keys. Amanda's surveillance cave confirms that Jeff is on the move. We can probably break down what's going on in that little cage. Five monitors, we see one camera. This is a closed loop security system. We've seen the first camera already and can assume that there's going to be four more. We'll tick off the five we already know exist, and we'll tally any extras along the way. John's got a headache, and Lynn decides to go looking for the problem. So, what are we looking at, Doc? Excedrin? Advil? Power drill. Okay, power drill. Let's go. Jeff tries his key on a locked door, but to no avail. Instead, he must face his fears. The seminal 1998 hit Batman and Robin villain, Mr. Freeze, in his lair. Oh, never mind. That's the angel of demonetization. Patreon-only content from here, folks. Welcome to your first test. Jeff. This trap is awful in concept as well as budget. 
Much like the elementary school trap, this is a lot of dressing on an otherwise empty salad. Which is to say, we're not charging for the location, and we don't charge for utilities, so the only things we can charge for in this room are locks, keys, and that tape player and cassette in the corner. It's curious that Jigsaw didn't just hang a tape, because Jeff by now has two micro cassette players in his pockets. This is how you hemorrhage money, John. <laughs> Jeff's first test is dealing with Danica, the only witness to his son's death. The key to her release, and Jeff's, is behind some very chilly pipes. As she slowly freezes to death, Jeff takes time to throw shade. Mrs. Freeze can't do much to defend herself, and Jeff chooses to watch her turn into a corpsicle. Giving himself the Christmas story treatment, Jeff grabs the key, regrets his shitty personality, and frees himself from the freezer. Another box gives Jeff another clue to his next test, and we're whisked away to, oh yeah, chainsaw. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's sitting on a table with some old meat grinders. I think Amanda was trying to make mannequin burgers. Uh, Lynn, meanwhile, is taking a look at some of the science projects in the studio. There's a call out to Paul and a familiar friend, except it's not. You see, what Lynn starts to approach is the reverse bear trap, but it's not the same reverse bear trap from Saw 1. This has been redesigned. You can thank my editor and wife for noticing this, by the way. There's little to no discussion about what this is, but we have a theory for you. This is Amanda's redesign of the reverse bear trap, a 1.5 iteration, if you will. We believe this bear trap represents a passing of the torch. This new trap is more streamlined with some extra metal support on the cranium. The piston is missing, and the gear work to set off the device has also been slimmed down. None of this prevents the trap's lethality, of course. The movie seems to confirm this with a flashback to Jigsaw setting up Amanda's trap. This is not the prop designers getting lazy or losing a reverse bear trap or intending it to be one thing when it's another. This is a distinct piece of art reflecting the transformation of the character it relates to. It's actually really touching in a fucked up serial killer kind of way. The space around the trap is old, covered in old tools. Nothing looks new here necessarily, even the lights are dim. Although we do get a shot of my old home phone. Remember when wireless house phones were new? Just me? Okay, I'll go die. Amanda gives Lynn the opportunity to bury the hatchet into the back of her head. But Lynn is a good person and opts not to take part in her peace negotiations. Instead, she tests out her new drill, though it doesn't look particularly new. The bit looks pretty clean. I'd hope so. Do we charge for it? Uh, well, technically surgery is part of Lynn's trap. I guess if we're going strictly by the it's for the purposes of the trap rules that we're really good at following, I guess we'll have to charge for the tools related to surgery. Ah, uh, should stay pretty cheap unless, I don't know, there's an automatically locking door hidden somewhere in John's hospice room. <laughs> then we'd have to charge for the whole room. <laughs> All right, you wore me down. We'll charge for the drill and the medical equipment. Meanwhile, Jeff is meandering his way to the next stage in his grief management therapy. Billy doing his best improv of Jeff's dead son. Adorable. You're doing great, Billy. We charged for a new Billy at the beginning of the film, but we need to charge for a new tricycle. Billy gets new tricycles. <laughs> Jeff shoulders his way into the next trap room. The door snaps shut behind him, and he's left to survey the room. I guess this is the Czar Bomba of meat grinders. Another micro cassette recorder and tape inform Jeff that he's got a special friend at the bottom of the slop vat. The man in the vat is Judge Turpin. I'm kidding. He's the judge who oversaw Jeff's case. How Jigsaw kidnapped a judge, I have no idea, but Batman better get here soon because the Punisher ain't doing shit. Jeff needs to burn his son's possessions to get the key that will free Judge Dredd. Otherwise, he'll drown in pig viscera. A Guar concert begins to take place on the judge's shirt as Jeff once again chooses violence. After watching three not-so-little pigs fall into the grinder, Jeff finally burns his son's possessions and begins to heal. Exalted, he rushes to the judge to save him. And he does. He actually saves someone. And apparently faster than John expected. Faster than I expected. Once again, this trap is technically cheap. There's a very old lock, a very old key, and a whole lot of pre-existing hardware. 
Frankly, the key and lock are so old, I'm not sure they can be bought new. I mean, I guess we'll use the old lock prices from Saw 2. Another filthy, cheap trap. Back in surgery, Lynn is prepping Jigsaw under the watchful gaze of a... Shrine to... Baphomet? Alright, well, nothing wrong with that. Hail Satan, let's get shopping. I'll spare everyone the mess, but if you've ever had a hard-boiled egg, it's kind of like that. Except that the shell is underneath a layer of bacon, and the bacon is your scalp. You. John sees his ex-wife Jill as he starts to code on the table. The moment is too much for Amanda, who excuses herself to also reminisce about the past. A healthier jigsaw, a simpler time. It's revealed that Amanda helped set up the bathroom trap with John. John gives himself a muscle relaxer as Amanda cleans up and starts the game. We know how the rest goes. Post-op, Amanda takes a moment to reward Lynn with a review of her bedside manner. He can't hear you. He doesn't even know you're there. We also get a shot of Amanda's piece. Very nice. Rack it up. Amanda! In another flashback, it's revealed that Amanda apparently finished off Adam even though he survived anyway. Joke's on her, it takes longer than that to suffocate someone. Back on the trail of his own misery, Jeff pushes on with his new best friend the judge in tow. Another box, another clue, and this time, a pistol clip. Perfect home for that little bullet. Behind the door is a fan favorite, the rack. Finally, some real hardware. The victim in this room is Timothy, the man who ran over Jeff's son. The micro cassette player around Timothy's neck reveals the nature of the trap. Tim's limbs will get twisted and broken, one by one, climaxing with his neck. <laughs> Tim's freedom lies in a glass box with a shotgun. A key affixed to a string affixed to the trigger of the shotgun will free Timothy for a price. So here are the easy bits to tally up. We got another micro cassette recorder. We got a key. We have a shotgun for $200 because no one knows how to buy guns in Texas. We can estimate that glass box to be about $100. And the pulleys and gears look eh, old and ratty enough that I'm willing to let them be scavenged from the factory. This is simply not the same mechanical quality we saw in Saw 2. But then there's the rack. We've got visible electronics. We've got extensive gear work. We've got steel beams. The question is, how much does it all cost? I spoke to some engineers to figure out roughly how much this could be sourced locally versus how much of this would need to be bought or machined. As it turns out, given the nature of the plant and the state of the gears, the only pieces Jigsaw wouldn't be able to easily forage are the motors and the digital switches that are activated by the timer. So here's how the rack works. Basically, there's an internal timer represented by the external stopwatch. When this unseen timer reaches zero, a signal goes through a logic circuit and triggers a power switch which sends flow to the associated motor. The timer resets automatically and the signal routes to another logic memory circuit, repeating the process until every motor has run its cycle. Likely, when the trap is powered on, it activated the external stopwatch to represent the total time remaining for the entire mechanism. It's like a cuckoo clock of death. Every chime starts a new rotation of events, events here being limbs. The timer, logic circuits, power switches, and motors run John around $700 if he's thrifty. Each motor would go for several hundred dollars brand new, but only as low as $100 used. And at this point in John's budget, we're talking about used parts. Logic circuits and power switches would total another 400 to 500 new, but used, we can talk it down to 150. That's very used. Allow $50 for the timer mechanism and fasteners and what have you, and yeah, 700 bucks. Add in the cost of everything else above, and you're looking at a juicy figure of $1,051.25. If you want to build your own The Rack, I suggest starting with Lego and going from there. Jeff the Concussed predictably takes his time taunting Tim before resolving to save him. Judge Judy does his best to grope the gears into stopping. They do not. Jeff figures out that he can just unscrew the key to get it. Unfortunately, he can't unscrew what's about to happen next. The key apparently is spring-loaded or reverse-weighted or something. Judge gets shot while Jeff struggles to remember where keys go. As his last friends die, Jeff removes his sweater out of respect. Amanda watches on with a freshly cracked energy drink. John, meanwhile, plays the role of a terrible fucking marriage counselor. I asked you to tell me about your husband. 
Matrimony's always fascinated me. Husbands barely able to look at their wives. Wives on their backs in motel rooms with perfect strangers. Till death do us part. My marriage has survived more suffering than someone like you could ever grasp. His love language is pain and voyeurism. Suffering? You haven't seen anything yet. Even on his deathbed, John can't let go of his totally reasonable philosophy. Someone like me, who am I? A murderer. I don't condone murder, and I despise murderers. Amanda the murderer takes this personally. Also, that's a micro cassette getting a spa treatment. But what's this? Our fucked up little Amanda family is falling apart. Who? I said no! Amanda's been slipping up, it seems, behind John's back. She doesn't deserve to go free. I'm a murderer. <laughs> and what about the other test subjects that we left alive? Is that how you felt about Eric Matthews? Eric Matthews. You left him for dead, didn't you? But I cleaned up your mistakes. Down in the tunnels where we left one Detective Matthews at the beginning of the film, he's free and roaming. Amanda clearly wasn't expecting this. She stalks him unsuccessfully and the two struggle. Matthews goes beast mode and beats the shit out of Amanda but he lands one blow that hits harder than the rest. You're not jigsaw, bitch! <laughs> Amanda thinks she's a murderer, but in truth, she's just kinda inept. Jigsaw admits to cleaning up her mistakes, plural. You left him for dead, but I cleaned up your mistakes. Jeff locates his last chance and the final piece of the puzzle, a gun, but it's too late. The game unravels, and Amanda shoots Lynn just as Jeff walks into the room. In a Pulp Fiction clash, he shoots Amanda in the throat. The surgery was Amanda's game to see if she could forgive herself and truly change. Left to pursue her own choices, Amanda has failed most spectacularly and bleeds out on the floor. Game over. Jigsaw gives Jeff a choice, save his wife or fulfill his vengeance. Jeff, do not miscalculate. Your fate is in my hands. Your wife's fate is in my hands. Jeff, drunk with rage, forgives John. I forgive you. He forgives him right through the throat with a circular saw. Jigsaw dies in a fountain of blood, playing his final message of the night. Hello, Jeff. I made this tape as an insurance policy, if you will. The door seals shut, locking everyone in. I was your final test. The door seals shut, locking everyone in? But, but that would mean, then we'd have to charge for the whole room. No, no, no! Fine, fine. Ugh. So there's definitely the door, right? And then there's the room. Oh, hi, Mark. Ugh. We can grab a few interesting statistics about the cost of a hospital room slash hospice setup. Your average hospital room is $250 to $450 per square foot in this lovely year of 2023. I cast some rune stones to come up with the best possible size of John's room, and it's maybe eight by 10. That means that if John's room were a hospital room, it would cost anywhere from $20,000 to $36,000 in 2023, or $13,131.37 to $23,636.46 in 2006. But that's if we're building and equipping a hospital room. Instead, this situation is more like hospice, where a pre-existing space is converted into a room built for medical needs. This is generally much, much, much cheaper since you only need to provide a bed, vitals monitor, any IV stands, a stock of medicine, tools, you get the idea. We can see the bed and price that for around $175 for the time. The vitals monitor on the left looks like it might be a slightly older model. We can price that around $120, while the vitals monitor on the right is slightly newer, $150. IV bag stands are rather accessible, $35. There's also a surgical observation lamp and tray that'll go for 118 and some overhead lights, 150. 
The wheelchair in the room came from Angel of Mercy Hospital, the same hospital John was interred in when Gordon was his doctor. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say that he stole it. The rest of the room is a lot of papers, bandages, some scales, kitchen pots. Look, I can't with any certainty list all the different medicines, prescriptions, and other chemicals inside all those cabinets. Frankly, I'm not gonna try. These things could have been harvested over the course of years. I also can't account for everything we don't see. There might be a single scalpel on screen, but there could be a box in a drawer. My best guess, the miscellaneous medical supplies add up to about $350. Finally, there's the tools of Jeff's consideration. We've got that little rotary saw that cracked open Jigsaw's eggshell. We've also got what looks like a potato masher or the gripper from a crane game next to some surgical bolt cutters. Uh, those things are $45. We've got a saw blade. And finally, we have the circular saw that Jeff chooses as his champion. The silver casing means that it's surgical, right? Nurse, surgical axe. That puts this oh, whole God. nonsense at a grand total of $1,563. There. Happy Jeff? Now, as I was saying, the door slammed shut, and it's revealed that Jeff and Lynn's daughter is locked away. Lynn's collar yeah. fires, Jeff is not happy, and Saw 3 comes to a very deadly close. Well, that was morose. Now that Jigsaw's dead, I doubt we'll be seeing much of him, but what of his bill? There's a debt to be paid, so let's rack it up. In total, Jigsaw spent approximately $8,373.36. Adjusting for inflation, that would make the value somewhere around $12,220.14 in 2023. However, we have a new contender, someone willing to split the check. It's implied in Saw 3 that Amanda constructed the elementary school Hellraiser trap, as well as the McRib special. That means Amanda's share of the bill is $788. However, I'm gonna assume that she borrowed from her saw daddy since I don't think she'd have much of an independent budget. So that all gets put back on Jigsaw's wallet. There were seven traps total in this film and the number gets a little hazy with the surgery room and the overlapping traps within traps within traps, so your interpretation may vary. The average cost spent on all these traps and trials was around $638.77. The most expensive was the Bedside Manor Surgical Room Fiasco at $1,563. This was followed closely by the rack at a fairly reasonable $1,051.25. The cheapest trap was actually the Meat Grinder Judge Destroyer, mostly due to shutting its door with gravity instead of motors at $89.11. Frankly, it could have been cheaper. Just saying. Second cheapest was the elementary school trap at $148, most of that being a nail bomb. Also, Saw 3 might have had the most micro cassette recorders of any Saw film so far. Really digging through the bargain bin at Radio Shack. I counted five in total. That's ridiculous. And that's it for Saw 3. Next up is Saw 4, which takes place concurrently with Saw 3, so that'll be interesting. If any special twist gets revealed there, it may change how the money shakes out here. But that's for future me to deal with. Or present me, as these research and editing things tend to turn out. Sorry, me. No worries, me. I want to give a special thanks to all my friends in all their various fields of science and engineering for wondering what it is I'm spending all my time on and why I'm asking all these strange questions at night. I also want to thank you, the audience, for coming back to watch these videos. I hope you enjoyed that Home Alone video too. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. It was a lot of fun to make and we're very proud of it. The new year holds a lot of exciting things for the channel. I'll be getting the Discord up and running. Uh, videos will be coming out on the Patreon by now as well, so you can check those out. Thank you all so much. I'm here to make stuff if you're here to watch.